All right, the famous messianic secret, beginning of the 20th century, German scholar by the name of Raid. Um, how do you account for the fact that as you go through the Gospel of Mark, more than any of the other Gospels, that uh, Jesus is commanding silence uh, to the demons, to the people that he heals, to disciples, and, uh, and just the, about a page on CCC 250 to 251, in a paragraph introduces you to the position that was espoused, and of course Vraid was uh, not a, uh, an orthodox uh, theologian. Uh, what he stated was this was Mark's literary device to account for the fact that Jesus was not more highly acclaimed to be the Messiah during his lifetime. That, uh, that, that Mark certainly could look back and as he was uh, penning this gospel, uh, he certainly affirmed the fact that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God. But uh, Jesus' contemporaries uh, did not hold to that. In fact, there could be a question, did the historical Jesus you know, really uh, uh, give enough evidence uh, for that to be so? But Mark, in, in writing this account, and uh, knowing that uh, this was an historical anomaly, that, uh, that in the earliest days uh, of Jesus' life, and then uh, the years right after his uh, death and uh, possible resurrection, uh, why is it that this was not, f this was not more fully acclaimed? And uh, so Mark comes up with this device, this literary device, to show that Jesus himself, even though he was the Messiah, uh, uh, called for this uh, uh, not testifying to that fact. And uh, so um, this is the reason why he was not affirmed. So that when we think in terms of the mess Messianic secret and the way it's developed over the last hundred years, the predominant position among New Testament scholars of the non-evangelical variety is that this was a literary device devised by Mark himself to account for the absence of faith in Jesus' Messiahship during his lifetime. So what Mark tries to do in his, in his record is show that Jesus truly was the Messiah, but uh, the, uh, the people did not give widespread ac uh, 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 assent to that because of uh, Jesus' own stopping of the demons or the healed persons or the disciples. We can take a look at Mark chapter 1. Uh, in verses, uh, um, it uh, should, let's see, I have the demons 132 to 134. That's right, verse uh, 34, he was not permitting the demons to speak because they knew who he was. But this is just a general statement <clears throat> of what Jesus was doing and uh, we have one specific example earlier on in that day, and you can go back to, uh, uh, to 124 as he, as he uh, casts the unclean spirit out of uh, the man, and, uh, and uh, the unclean spirit cries out, seeing Jesus, verse 24, what do we have to do with you Jesus of Nazareth, have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, paraphrase, shut up and come out of him. <laughs> now, wait a minute. We know who you are. I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Isn't Jesus the Holy One of God? 
Why does it say to the demon, hey, keep going. I like what you're saying. These people need to hear it. And uh, shut up, come out of him. And throwing him into convulsions, the unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice. So he submits to the authority, but it lets, he know, it lets us know that he is not submissive. And came out of him. So why does Jesus tell him to be quiet when he is making affirmation of who he is? And then down in chapter 1, verse 44, he heals this uh, man who had leprosy. And verse 44, he says to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priests and offer for you're cleansing what Moses commanded for a testimony to them. So you're healed, but don't say anything to anyone. Now, interestingly, in 145, he went out and proclaimed it freely. So much so that Jesus wasn't able to enter into a city publicly, but had to stay out in the wilderness, unpopulated areas. But even then, they kept coming to him from everywhere. So very interestingly, uh, the... Uh, we have an unsubmissive demon, but ultimately has to obey. And then we have this uh, healed leper who is unsubmissive, who does not obey, but uh, does exactly what Jesus told him not to do. And uh, then in chapter 8, verse uh, 30, having uh, have the testimony by Peter, you are the Christ, in chapter 8, verse 30, and he warned them to tell no one about him. All right, so we have these times when Jesus says, be quiet, don't speak, don't tell anybody. Warn them that they tell no one about him. So why? Why? Well, rather than saying that, well, Jesus was trying to say, shh, People might get the idea I'm the Messiah. Don't, don't, you know, don't, don't speak. Be quiet. And they might actually think I'm the Holy One of God. So demons, just cool it. it it's not that. It, it's a reflection of Jesus' own ministry. Why did he stop the demons? Even though the demons knew and were giving testimony clearly to who he was. Well, in the ancient world, the one who names has greater power than the one named. So even though the demons were truthfully speaking about Jesus, they knew he was, they affirmed who he was. By giving that public affirmation, they are seeking still to exercise authority over Jesus. And we can see from that, that the demon He's unsubmissive. They don't want to submit even to the knowledge they have of Jesus. They want to be superior. They want to have a greater authority than Jesus. Therefore, Jesus shows his authority over them. And ultimately, it's not the testimony of demons. It is his own testimony through word and deed that is to be accepted and acted upon in, uh, in faith. So that's why he stops the demons. Well, what about the heal? Well, in 144, that's just following uh, Leviticus. Uh, Leviticus chapter 15, when a, uh, 14, 15, uh, 13, 14, when a leper was healed, he was to go to the priest, and the priest was to verify first his leprosy, chapter thir uh, 13, and his healing, chapter 14, and affirm that this came from God. So he is short-circuiting, as it were, the, uh, the testimony uh, that was to be given in the Old Testament. And again, the other healed people, chapter 5, chapter 7, uh, at this point did not know and uh, had not and could not confirm the reality of Jesus as the Messiah. And certainly that was with the disciples. Uh, he warned them to tell no one about him in 8.30. And uh, and then as he starts to explain as the Messiah, as the Son of Man, going to Jerusalem to die, he, uh, 
his rebuke by Peter and turns around seeing his disciples. He rebukes Peter and says, get behind me, Satan, if you're not setting your mind on God's interest. But man's, again, they're able to affirm that Jesus is the Christ, but at this point, they still have an incomplete understanding of what Jesus as Messiah meant as far as his immediate ministry was concerned. But to them, Messiah was now going to go to Jerusalem and rule, not going to go to Jerusalem and die, and even when he tells them. And uh, so it's interesting in chapter 9 that, uh, that he, he tells them not to talk about the transfiguration, 9-9, nine, nine, until the Son of Man should rise from the dead. So that even the silence is not a silence forever. When you truly come to understand not only I am Messiah, but what Messiah has, why Messiah has come in this first coming and how this ties in to what Messiah is going to do in the future. Once you start to understand what my being the Messiah means, then you can freely proclaim it. By the way, interestingly, Jesus did not always forbid people from... Uh, from speaking. Take a look at chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 18. This extensive narrative. Again, Mark, more extensive of what we have in Matthew and Luke of uh, the healing of the demoniac, the man with the demon. And notice in verse 18. The man who had, the demon, who had been demon-possessed, was entreating him that he might accompany him. And he did not let him, but says to him, go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. You're not going to come. You go and you proclaim what the Lord has done for you. Now, you have to realize that he is from the Gerasenes. He is from an area of Gentiles. Uh, they have no messianic conception that, uh, that can be misunderstood. All they know is, is Jesus is Lord. Jesus has shown his authority over the demons. He is master. He is sovereign. He is the one, therefore, that should be responded to in faith. All right, and so to the demoniac, hey, don't, you're not coming with us. You're going to go back and you're going to proclaim what the Lord has done. And he went off and began to proclaim in Decapolis what great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. And they knew who this man was. They knew what his previous state had been. And uh, certainly now when they see him, you know, in his right mind, like a normal person, what happened? And so he's able to give his testimony about how the healing had come through Jesus. How even the, uh, how the, how the demon has said, Jesus, son of the most high God. And how that testimony could uh, then be given among those Gentiles. And they marvel because obviously... Here was Jesus, who is none other than uh, the one who is the, uh, the Son of the Most High God, the one who has this authority over the demons. And uh, they, they marvel, and of course this would prepare the way ultimately as the gospel went to the Gentiles that uh, truly, again, here's a Gentile audience being aware of the fact that here is a man who's more than a man. Here's a man that, uh, that is God. And so you can see how that uh, plays a role even in uh, Mark's purpose as far as the gospel is concerned. So uh, uh, the secret of the messianic secret is there is no secret. Uh, Jesus clearly displays by his actions predominantly in Mark's gospel, but also his words that he was the Messiah. He was the one anticipated by Israel on the basis of the Old Testament. But more than that, the one who is the Messiah 
He is the Son of God. He is the Son of the Holy One, the Son of the Most High. He is the one who has all power and authority. He is, he is a greater than man with whom also Gentiles have to do. And uh, so uh, Mark makes it very, very clear. And if you take a look within the historical context, you can realize why it is that he is, he, he is silencing certain individuals, but he is not silencing others. Well, when it comes to preaching Mark, I would put it this way, Mark is proclamation. So understand what Mark is proclaiming, how Mark is proclaiming it, and, uh, and literally to get his proclamation right is to get your preaching right as well. And so there is a very definite sense in which uh, Mark's gospel is the easiest to, to preach. He's, he's done a lot of the work for you. It, it's vivid. It is, it is gripping. And, uh, and it is a, a narrative uh, which uh, keeps the hearer on the edge of their seat. And, uh, you know, so, so, so gentlemen, you know, you, you don't, you don't preach it in this way, Mark chapter 4. And on that day when evening had come, he said to them, let's go over to the other side. Leaving the multitude, they took along with them. He took, they took him along with them just as he was in the boat. No, oh, the boats were with him. There arose a fierce gale. Now, gentlemen, and on that day when evening had come, he says to them, let's go over to the other side. And leaving the multitude, they take him along with them, just as he was in the boat. The other boats were, were with him. And there arises a fierce gale of wind. <laughs> and the waves were, were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was filling up. And of course, with a storm like that, the other boats are long gone. One boat bobbing in the midst of this great storm. And he himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. <laughs> the great storm and Jesus is asleep. And they awake him and say to him, teacher, don't you care about ready to die? And being aroused, he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, be still. And the wind died down and it became perfectly calm. And he said to them, Why are you so timid? How is it you have no faith? And they became very much afraid. And said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Who is it? Who can rebuke the wind? Speak to the sea. And the wind stops and the sea becomes calm. So, I mean, get Mark, you can preach it, right? Okay, so that was my two-minute message on and from, you know, Mark. So, as I said, if you will just get what Mark has already given to you. I, I like to put it this way, gentlemen. If, if you can't preach Mark, you can't preach. <laughs> All right, get it, preach it. All right, now, certainly you can add even more color to it, but uh, Mark doesn't allow you to be drab and boring. Uh, if you are, well, there's not much hope for you <laughs> as far as being a preacher is concerned. Look, if an introverted Englishman can get into this text, you can too, all right? 
All right, let's move on to, uh, to Luke X. We turn the page to Dr. Luke. Now, as we come to Luke's gospel, we come to, once again, a very important and significant part of the New Testament. And read Luke and then read Acts and immediately, because we just left Mark, immediately you'll find out that reading the first few verses of the gospel and then the book of Acts, we have uh, the same author, the same audience, and uh, the same purpose implied. As you take a look at uh, Luke 1 3, you see that this text has been written to an individual by the name of Theophilus. And when you get to Acts 1 1, uh, you find again this is a second narrative that has been written to the same man. In fact, uh, we have the author's own description of what is in the first volume. The first writing, that is all Jesus began to do and to teach. So Jesus is the one who acts, and Jesus is the one who speaks. So this, this certainly is the emphasis, and of course, implication, that uh, the next volume is going to be about what Jesus continues to do and to teach. But of course, Jesus is no longer present. So. He's going to do it by means of the Holy Spirit through his, uh, his apostles whom he has commissioned. But not only the audience, Theophilus, but also we have the writer himself, uh, 1, 3 of Luke. It seemed fitting for me as well, as many others have taken to write an account, it seemed fitting for me as well to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus. And then of course, the first account I composed, I made, I wrote uh, Theophilus. And so we have uh, the same author. And we have the same assurance. That is the same purpose uh, because Luke does not leave us without knowing why he has written the gospel. One for, so that you, Theophilus, might know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. And uh, the, final, uh, uh, the final word in, in the Greek is the assurance. You might know about the things you've been taught assuredly. They are true, I, that, uh, as you read in, in the, the New American Standard. So that he has written for the purpose of giving assurance to Theophilus that what he has been taught, what he knows, is true. Now, when you get to the beginning of Acts, there is no purpose statement. So I say, okay, I can see the same author, I can see the same audience, but how do you know it's the same purpose? Well, because in the Greco-Roman world, when uh, there would be a sequel, a follow-up volume to a previous volume, if the, if the purpose statement was not stated uh, new or had uh, not changed, then the same purpose of the first volume would be assumed to be the purpose of the second volume as well. So the whole of Luke X was to give Theophilus assurance the things he had been taught were true. That is, the things about Jesus and the things about what Jesus had done in his incarnation and what Jesus continued to do through the apostles and the message that had come to Theophilus about Jesus through the, uh, the messengers. So this is the relationship between the Gospel of Luke and Acts, and uh, there might be one or two skeptics around who don't think 
that uh, these came from the same man to the same audience, uh, but those individuals are few and far between. It's very, very clear from the text that, uh, that these volumes uh, go together. Now, this is not First and Second Luke. This, this is not a, a history as we have in the Old Testament, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, that had, been, uh, that had been written as a unity and then when placed on scrolls, they were divided for convenience. Uh, this is where we have a volume written and then there is a period of time when there is a second then self-contained volume that is sent to the same individual. So it's not Theophilus received one long narrative that later got divided. It is the fact that he received two volumes, maybe two, possibly four or five years apart. There's a time gap and each individual volume is a standalone volume. Though obviously, uh, I believe Luke already had in mind, even as he was writing Luke, that there would be a follow-up volume. And uh, certainly when we get to the book of Acts, we find that there are many echoes, as we're going to see, in the book of Acts with what is in what we now call the Gospel of Luke. Now, we can talk about the importance of Luke-Acts. Uh, the first thing is, is these two volumes make up approximately 28% of the totality of the New Testament. In fact, getting you ready for final jeopardy, and if you do have this question, or have this answer and give the right question, you've got to give 10% back to TMS. But if the final Jeopardy uh, uh, answer was, he is responsible for more words in the New Testament than any other author, don't put down who is Paul. You will lose. Don't put down who is John. You lose. The correct answer is, who is Luke? Luke is responsible for more of the New Testament than any other individual author. Now, right away, the Holy Spirit has shown you the importance of Luke-Acts. It is, it is vital to the New Testament. If, if Matthew is the foundation, Luke-Acts is the heart of the New Testament. It is the most complete New Testament history. By the way, even in, in the first chapter, it goes further back than any of the other accounts that we have in the canon. It goes all the way back to the announcement of the birth of John to Zacharias in the temple. And uh, possibly as far back as 6 BC. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, goes back with that announcement and uh, then the pregnancy of Elizabeth who was about ready to bear, with, bear her child uh, and when uh, Mary comes to visit her. And uh, so certainly uh, um, the announcement seems to be at least six months and beyond, beyond the uh, uh, the actual uh, uh, announcement to Mary, and then the birth of, of Jesus. So uh, we're going back maybe 15 months before the actual birth of, of Jesus Christ. Uh, so, so Luke is uh, certainly going further back, and obviously he's the only one of the gospel writers that we know of within the canon who wrote a second volume and takes, uh, takes the, uh, the history all the way to A.D. 60. In fact, he goes all the way to the end of, of a Paul's uh, uh, house arrest in Rome. He'd been there for two years, and if uh, he got there in A.D. 60, he goes to about A.D. 62. 
So, uh, so Luke's Gospel and the book of Acts encompasses a period of about 65 years worth of history. And significantly, then becomes Luke Acts the foundation uh, for the understanding of the letters of the New Testament. So it not only gives us the most complete New Testament history, but it becomes foundational, yes, historically. And when we start to look at the letters, particularly the Pauline letters, we're going to find out that we're able to, to basically be able to, to date them and put them in their historical sequence based upon what is in the book of Acts. So we know, for instance, when Paul ministered in Corinth. And so we have some conception of the dating of 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Uh, we know when he anticipated going to Rome. So we have some idea of when he would send the letter while he was in Corinth to Rome. Uh, we know from the book of Acts when he ministered in Thessalonica, when he ministered in Ephesus, etc. It gives us an idea of when these letters were written in Philippi and Philippians. So certainly, historically, we know that Luke Acts is key to having appreciation for the historical background of the letters. But more than that, Luke Acts also helps us understand the theological foundation of the letters as well, particularly the Pauline letters. Because so much not only of Paul's history, but also Paul's ministry and Paul's theology is already narrated for us in the book of Acts. So not only do we need Luke Acts for putting, bringing together the, the New Testament historically, but also for understanding its connections theologically as well. In fact, we are doubly blessed. We get to read Paul's own words in his letters. We get to put Paul's theology within his historical context in the book of Acts. So it is a, a foundation for understanding what comes, comes after in the rest of the New Testament. And realize from, from Romans all the way, even to Revelation, we're dealing with epistolary literature. Even Revelation is, first and foremost, a letter to the seven churches. Now, quite an interesting body, but nevertheless, it's still uh, basically in... The, uh, the form of a letter. So Luke Acts is a vital part, an important part, a highly significant part of uh, the New Testament that has basically been ignored uh, throughout church history. Well, well, let me just jump ahead as far as the book of Acts. Uh, the book of Acts was uh, just viewed as nothing more than the history of the church, just a historical document that really had no major theological import, both within uh, the, uh, the Catholic tradition and even followed up in the Protestant tradition after the Reformation. Uh, the Lord providentially brought two things to bear in the 19th century and then the beginning part of the 20th century. Uh, one positive and one that's a little more negative that, uh, that rehabilitated the study of uh, Luke Acts. And in the 19th century, it was the Protestant missionary movement and, and the great debate about, you know, Paul's missionary methods. You know, our missionary methods, Paul's or, or ours, uh, Roland Allen, uh, writing down the early part of the 20th century. So, so a, a, as, as mission theology started to develop within the 19th century, uh, the book of Acts started to be mined. And then with the Pentecostal and then charismatic and now third wave movement in uh, the 20th and in the 21st century, the book of Acts once again is, um, 
is foundational in uh, study and uh, in preaching. And uh, you're a Grace Community Church, so come Sunday night. Acts is being preached. All right, so key book. And, uh, and if you get Acts and to understand what's in Acts, you've got to go back to Luke. So Luke Acts. And uh, post-World War II has uh, seen a resurgence in uh, the study of these two books. Well, the relationship, the importance, a little bit about the background. The, uh, the author not only introduces himself at the beginning of uh, both volumes, but as you're reading through the volumes, you, uh, you come to Acts chapter 16, and uh, in Acts chapter 16, all of a sudden, the author inserts himself into the narrative. And uh, by the way, this is, this is not a debate like Mark chapter 14. Who was that young man that we talked about last time? It is very, very certain that here we have the author. So we're going along reading in Acts chapter 16, where we're tracing at this point the ministry of the Apostle Paul. And he comes to Troas, not knowing exactly where he is to go. And in 16.9 of Acts, in a vision, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A certain man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Right, so the appeal comes to, to Paul. And when he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. All right, Paul, all right. Silas, yes, he's, he, he's with uh, Paul. Timothy has been added to the team, chapter 16, verses 1 to 3. But where did we come from? Paul, Silas, Timothy, and the author of the text. By the way, notice, God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Whatever else this author was, he was a preacher of the gospel. He's one of the preachers that goes into Macedonia. And uh, so he is, as I place within the notes very definitely, a ministry companion of the Apostle Paul. Now, after the narrative concerning Philippi is done, no more Mr. Anonymous until chapter 20. Now, Paul is uh, preparing uh, to, uh, to go to Jerusalem. And... Uh, and in verse 4, he was accompanied by a number of men. But verse 5, these had gone ahead and were waiting for us at Troas. So interestingly, he comes through Macedonia, has these men with him, and uh, then meets Mr. Anonymous again. Or they, they went ahead and uh, waited uh, had gone ahead and were waiting for us when they got to Troas. Significantly, he comes back in the narrative in Macedonia, very possibly Philippi, and goes to Troas. Troas was the first place we met him. So in chapter 16, we have from Troas to Philippi. In chapter 20, we have from Philippi to Troas, and he continues on, and uh, on the way to Miletus, 
And uh, in chapter uh, 21, he continues on from Miletus uh, with, the, uh, with the Apostle Paul all the way to Jerusalem. And then after Paul's arrested in Jerusalem, we lose track of him. No more Mr. We. Until we get to Acts chapter 27, when uh, Paul begins his journey as a Roman prisoner to Rome. And uh, significantly, again, we, uh, we find out in chapter 27, uh, verse 2, and embarking on a ship we put out to sea. We put out to sea. And the next day, we put in at Sidon, Sidon etc. All the way through chapter uh, 28, verse 16, and when we entered Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldiers who were guarding him. And now the narrative is uh, what Paul did in his own in his own house where he was under guard. He was not allowed to move freely anymore. And all of a sudden, Mr. We goes. Kind of like when Paul gets back into confinement, Mr. We is no more to be found. I guess he likes his freedom. He likes his freedom in Jerusalem. He likes his freedom in Rome. I'm joking, of course. Um, he probably came back and visited from time to time. But yes, uh, in other words, he's, he's, he's not with the Apostle Paul continually in Rome for two years the same way he had not been continually with the Apostle Paul from his uh, imprisonment, arrest and imprisonment in Jerusalem through his time at Caesarea. Uh, about a two-year period as well. So uh, when it comes to being with Paul from Caesarea to Rome, he is present. So he is present for a significant amount of uh, the narrative that is given to us in the book of Acts. And, uh, and certainly he is a, a ministry companion of the Apostle Paul. And he is with him on some very significant occasions. Going to Macedonia, going to Jerusalem, going to Rome. So some of the vital movements of the Apostle Paul, this, uh, this author, was, uh, was present. Now the longer Western text actually incorporates at times early church tradition. And uh, even though we don't believe that uh, the Western text, what it adds in 1128 was originally in the text, this is something added. Uh, but uh, this gives us the insight that possibly um, Luke was part of the church at Antioch. For when he narrates about the church at Antioch receiving the prophecy from Agabus, when we were gathered together. So in the Western text, that's the first place we have the, uh, the author speaking about himself. Now, whether he was from Antioch or not, you know, we, get, we cannot be certain. But uh, certainly within the text of Acts, we see that whoever the author was, he, he spent some very important ministry time with the Apostle Paul. Well, less discussion has entailed about the author than who is the reader. Theophilus. Now, Theophilus means lover of God. It uh, was a well-known name in the Greek or Roman world, particularly among Greeks. <laughs> I mean, what parent didn't want to have their son be a lover of God? Think about it. So, uh, so many Greeks would... Uh, would name a, a son Theophilus, lover of God. And because of that meaning, there has been a minority tradition um, that Theophilus is not a real person. 
It's a title for any lover of God who has come to faith in Jesus Christ. Theophilus is, is no one in particular. It is all those who are lovers of God from among the Gentiles. Now in Luke 1.3, note carefully, Theophilus is, is given these words, most excellent Theophilus. And uh, most excellent is also a title that is given three times in the book of Acts. Acts 23, 26, 24, 3, 26, 25. For the Roman governors Felix and then Festus. So to say that one is most excellent is to say that one has a certain status, privilege, and, uh, and because of that position, a certain honor, a certain respect needed to be given to that individual. Not only does most excellent help us appreciate the fact that Theophilus is a real individual. He wouldn't call a generic man most excellent. Within, within the Greek or Roman world, that meant something, that acclamation of being a most excellent individual. But also tells us something about Theophilus. Now, we don't know what, but when Luke wrote to Theophilus his gospel, we can assume by calling him most excellent that at that point, Theophilus had some authoritative position within the Roman bureaucracy. We don't know what it was, not necessarily a governor. But he had some role, and, and, and most Roman citizens uh, sometime during their life would do their civil, civic duty by, uh, by being involved for a year or two doing some kind of governmental service for Rome. And at that point, as they did it, they, because they had an official Roman position, uh, that had to be recognized. Now, significantly, when you get the book of Acts, Theophilus is not called most excellent. Now, some have argued because of that, well, he was a non-believer, and so Paul has to, has to be true to the society, call him most excellent. And by the time you get to the book of Acts, he's become a believer. And uh, so those titles aren't, any, you know, aren't necessary any longer. Uh, to that, I would say baloney that uh, as we get into the, the New Testament letters of the Apostle Paul and, and even Peter, that, that just because you are believers doesn't mean you don't have the common courtesies of uh, recognizing believers might have, have uh, a certain uh, positions in society that outside of the church are, are still to be recognized. I, I would say the distinction is that, as I've said, in uh, the late 50s, he was an official. And by the time you get to the early 60s, he was no longer in that official capacity within the Roman bureaucracy, the Roman government. And uh, so Paul, I mean, uh, Luke no longer has to call him by that title. Now, if this is true, it says something about Theophilus. Theophilus being most excellent, had to be a Roman citizen. Certainly uh, having a position, particularly a sometime position in the Roman government, meant that he had not only uh, 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 citizenship, but he had prominence. In fact, you would also assume that he had great wealth. 
And by the way, in the, this is a novel idea for contemporary politics. But in the, uh, the Greco-Roman world, when you served in a governmental capacity, you, 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 you took your, uh, your monies out of your, your own pocket. It was an honor, you know, to be a governor. It was an honor, you know, to, uh, uh, to be a, a legate of some kind of Rome. And you, you paid, you, you, you supported yourself. I've often thought about how many representatives and senators we would have in Washington, how many legislators in California if they had to support themselves. By the way, that was the original concept. Citizen representatives. And of course, we got away from that because that means only the affluent can serve. If you can't support yourself, you can never be a, a, um, uh, involved in a government service in that way. Uh, I'm not so sure paying them is any more uh, <laughs> beneficial, uh, but that's for another class. Um, but Theophilus, and the idea that he, he maybe just served for a number of years, again, would give the idea, not only he's a citizen, he was a man of prominence, but he was also a man of great wealth. And uh, he was a patron, and not only is what Luke writes in Luke Acts for Theophilus as a man, but he would also have the wherewithal, prominence, and money to be able to take what Luke had written to him and make copies and make it available for others. He could also be Luke's literary patron. So uh, there's a lot that is unearthed by that little term, most excellent as far as uh, who Theophilus was. Now Theophilus 1.4 had been taught that you might know the exact things of what you've been taught. And the verb is used in the book of Acts both for that which was just essentially the, uh, the gospel proclaimed and uh, then the teaching that uh, believers received after conversion. And it would seem that uh, if uh, Most Excellent does not argue for Theophilus being a non-believer in the book of Acts, it's best to assume that he was already a believer that he had been taught. Certainly there's no debate when we get to the book of Acts. He is a believer in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So why does he need assurance? By the way, the very fact that the same, the same purpose statement encompasses both works, that this, this is united. If he's a believer in Acts, it would assume he's also a believer in Luke. He is a believer who needs assurance that what he has been taught is true. So how did he come to faith? Well, Luke is writing to him. Luke's a proclaimer of the gospel. Luke is a, is, is a party to the Pauline ministry. Who is Theophilus? Theophilus is a Gentile who has come to faith in Jesus Christ either directly through Luke, or directly through Paul, or through Paul slash Luke's ministry, has been taught essentially the truths concerning Jesus Christ. So why would we think that Theophilus would have any doubts? Read Luke Acts. And we think when we get to the book of Acts, we find out that Gentiles were not accepted into the Messianic believers without problems arising among certain Jews. Certain Jewish believers and also certain Jewish unbelievers. 
had a hard time with the fact that Gentiles could be believers in Jesus Christ and be a part of the Messianic community without being circumcised and keep the law. Now, not only as you read through Luke Acts, do you see this being an issue? But when we get into the Pauline letters themselves, guess what we're going to come across? In the vast majority of the letters, Paul has to defend his gospel against those who say that he has compromised the gospel by allowing Gentiles to come into the faith without being circumcised and keep the law. In fact, out of the 13 Pauline letters, we're going to find out at least 10 deal with the issue of false teaching. And the false teaching that has a Jewish background that has permeated in to the Gentiles. And uh, Paul has to write the correct, to defend and correct these teachings that are, are, are influencing these Gentiles. What L Paul does in his letters, Luke does in his narrative. If I might put it this way, Luke Acts is nothing less than a historical narrative apologetic for the Pauline Gospel. And hold on until next hour when we'll try to show you that development. The date depends exactly when Luke wrote Luke. Did he write it in Caesarea? Did he write it in Rome? Don't know. He wrote it in Caesarea, A.D. 58. And uh, by A.D. 63, he has written the book of Acts. Um, because he ends it where it does, because that's where I believe the history comes to an end. So probably in about a four-year period, 58 for Luke, 62 for the book of Acts, if you want me to be really precise. And, uh, but I can't be dogmatic. It could just be a two-year period between 60 when they came to Rome and 62 when the two years was, uh, was up. But, uh, but I believe very possibly that uh, the Gospel of Luke was uh, completed uh, before Luke left uh, Palestine. And then Acts was written from Rome to Theophilus. Where was Theophilus? Big question mark. Don't know. Gives you something to talk to him about when you meet him in the millennium. Ah, oh, you're Theophilus. We talked about you in 601. Where exactly did you live? Where did you come from? By the way, what, ex what position exactly did you have in the Roman go how government? How long did you serve? How, long, how much did it cost you? By the way, how much did it cost you? How many copies of, of Luke Acts did you distribute? How, how much did that cost you? Um, so it gives you a few things to chat over coffee, you know, with Theophilus when you meet him, okay? So our class has eternal significance. <laughs>